O Comsnet. I'm Lauren Strayer. I'm the Managing Director of Communications and Network at Democracy Fund. And I am very excited to be here today to introduce this conversation to you. For those of you who don't know Democracy Fund, we're a bipartisan foundation. We were created by eBay founder and philanthropist Pierre Omidyar. You might know a bunch of our colleagues who are here who are at other Omidyar group entities, so be sure to say hi if you see them. At Democracy Fund, we envision a democracy that is healthy, resilient, and diverse, which is kind of hard to imagine right now. We're really fortunate to work with people and groups that are leading the way to strengthen our public square, to help Congress have more capacity to function and to, to, to function, excuse me, and to make sure that our elections are running in a strong way. In this particular political moment, we're also really proud to be supporting people who are combating abuses of power, defending the fourth estate, and fighting the bigotry and hate that some are fomenting inside our politics. And you know, we're really proud to work with a lot of you in this room. We're proud to stand up for our democracy with a lot of the different foundations who are here. And at Democracy Fund, we're also really trying hard to listen better to the American people. Um, and that is part of why we gave you the mystery swag, which I know a lot of you have been wondering about, yes? This little megaphone thing is, in fact, a cell phone amplifier. You just slide it over the speaker of your phone, and then when you're listening to your podcast or your music or Master of None, it will be a little bit louder for you. And, you know, I don't think you'll be surprised when I tell you that the voter study group is about listening. I think for most of us in this room, the last two weeks have been rough, if you care about our democracy. And that's on top of two, three years that have been really hard to take in. When our politics are this angry and this loud and this hateful, listening is hard to do and it becomes ever more important. So we convened the Democracy Fund Voter Study Group, which is a group of about two dozen scholars, political pollsters, researchers. We've got folks from the left and the right and the center and we came together because we wanted to understand what happened. So using deep longitudinal public opinion survey data, we've started studying like, what happened? Why did it happen? Who's voting which ways? Who are the Trump voters? What types of Trump voters are there? And while I am super tempted to go into all the details of what we've learned, what I really want to say is that this project is about listening. It's because we at Democracy Fund believe that our leaders, civic and elected, need to listen better to the American public. And I think what's interesting about the group of people in this room is that it, as communicators, we're uniquely positioned to do that. We all know communications isn't a one-way street. We all know that our communications and our philanthropy will only have the impact we want it to have if we understand what the motivations and needs of our communities and audiences are. Like, we really deeply understand why, even when it's hard, we have to listen, and that we have to do it intently, consistently, and with an open mind. Now, I do want to be clear that listening doesn't mean that we abandon our values. We still have to stand up in this moment. It's really important, and we have to figure out how to listen at the same time. So one quick plug, if standing up for our democracy and listening sounds interesting to you, Democracy Fund is hiring. Please come find me or our communications director, Najma Roberts. We'd be glad to tell you about our open positions on comms. Yep, I see Najma's raising her hand over here. Um, we'd be glad to tell you about our open positions on communications or partnerships. But um, let me actually introduce the people that you came to, to listen to. Uh, these are two folks who are listening and standing up in their own fields. First, we have Lara Satrakian, who is the CEO, co-founder, and executive editor of News Deeply, which, if you don't know it, is an amazing platform that is marrying journalism and community insights. She's an award-winning reporter. She has a really rich background in the Middle East. And I especially want to call out that recently, she was one of the first Me Too whistleblowers, and since then has co-founded an amazing organization called press forward, which is challenging cultures inside newsrooms. And so, Laura, I want to thank you. Yep. 
Your leadership is really remarkable. Laura is going to be interviewing David Frum. David is a senior editor at The Atlantic and the author of nine books, including most recently, Trumpocracy. He was a speechwriter to President George W. Bush, and he's held many senior leadership positions in GOP politics. In fact, he was, until recently, the chair of the board of the leading center-right think tank in the UK, Policy Exchange. And I think, as many of you know, he is one of the leading and probably too few voices on the right defending our liberal democratic values. And so I know, David, we're going to be very interested to hear what you have to say about that. Uh, and so please join me in welcoming Lara and David to the stage. Hi. So guess what? We're going to have a calm and thoughtful conversation about US politics. <laughs> the decibels will remain roughly at this level, unless the Q&A goes bonkers, but we'll find out. I love Comnan, and I'm so happy to be here with David Frum for this very important conversation, someone I admire a great deal for many, many reasons, prolific analyst, uh, and just has shared his insights at critical moments in American life. Also someone I have disagreed with uh, on a number of levels. Uh, you were part of the Bush White House during the run-up to the Iraq War, you authored or credited with authoring the Axis of Evil speech, the 2002 State of the Union address, and not that this was on you, but in another era where journalists were under a lot of pressure and many of them succumbed to be boosters for the Iraq War policy rather than critical thinkers in the run-up to that war. And so in preparing for this session, I really had to reflect on all of that. And where I landed was really in reframing you, in my mind, as someone far bigger than one policy or one view or one era, one chapter. As you and I have also talked about, I have tremendous admiration for your late mother, who was one of the legendary yep. Canadian journalists of our time. And I feel really grateful that we get to talk today about where we are, where we're going, and how we communicate with our fellow citizens. So for me, the preparation for this was an experimental taste of what it means to look past deep disagreement for just a conversation. And so now how do we do that at the national level? It's October 2018, and we are sandwiched between the bitter confrontation uh, around the confirmation of Justice Brett Kavanaugh and the midterm congressional elections. So I wanted to just start with, where are we? I mean, where, how do you see the past six weeks influencing the next six months? Well, thank you. I'm so glad to be with you. I'm so glad to be on this stage, although I do feel that I should stand up, cast aside this conversation, and burst into a round of memories from cats. Uh, <laughs> it seems to call for that. Uh, um, but you, you put your finger on a, a, a sentence that I find myself thinking about a lot these days, and that is the sentence with which Pre uh, Abraham Lincoln opened his Great House Divided speech in 1858. If we could know where we are and whither we are tending, we could better judge what to do and how to do it. So I think we need to take that view of both past and future. Um, I have, as I'm sure you have and many people have, I, I have lived through the past two plus years, waking up in the morning with a tremendous feeling of dread and wrongness. I'm so glad the man in the high castle is back on the air. I think it's the one show that does justice to the state of feeling of just, you're, you, you are in the dark dystopian timeline. And, um, I have, in the past few weeks, though, begun to have a different set of emotions. Um, that have become more and more to the fore, and that is, a strangely, a, a feeling of, of gratitude. Because as dark as these times have been in a lot of ways, they have also been inspiring. I think one of the Roman writers, I now forget which one, said, be grateful to live at a time when your country needs you. And that's my first gratitude, is I have a sense that this is a moment when we are needed, as maybe at other times we have not been, what was more optional, and to live at a time like that, to be able to contribute something to the stream of your country's history, that's a great thing. Um, I, have been, I, I have been grateful too, because I think there are things in this time, I call them the perverse gifts of Trump, that there are things that he has inadvertently given the country, a, a gift of wider sympathy, as, as Lauren was saying with the, the democracy funds work, things have happened, to many of the Americans who have not participated in this great global economy, they need attention. And I'm grateful, too, to see 
how much more civic engagement is. Everyone, I'm sure this is your experience, everyone in journalism knows that we're not only being read more, but read differently, more intensely. And that is something for which I'm grateful. We're very mean to each other, at least in this upper sphere and the recorded broadcast sphere. Is that the new normal? Are we locked in to a certain incivility at this point? Um, when we say um, we, I mean, you mean like politicians, journalists, cultural elites? I mean, my, our profession, the, the, the pundits, or whatever, we're contentious and adversarial to an extent that is unproductive and yeah. people feel like they're watching a shouting match with very little substance rather than a civic debate that gets somewhere. Yeah. Well, well, some of that is an artificial production of the decisions of cable TV programmers, which are, I think, actually kind of hard to defend. Um, I mean, if you were ever to look at the numbers that these shows get, I sometimes wonder, um, given how few people watch cable, why don't you do something good? Uh, why don't you do something good? Um, you know, at uh, 11 a.m. on a weekday morning, there are probably 125,000 people watching CNN, uh, many of them because they are in, um, recovering from a ski accident and can't reach the channel changer. <laughs> it, have a two-hour conversation on the origins of the 2008 financial crisis. Probably you will not get fewer than 125,000. But, but we have, that. there's this idea that um, you know, that what people want to watch is violent conflict on cable. And the numbers don't bear it out. It is astonishing. I mean, you were kind enough to uh, revert, uh, refer to my late mother. My, my late mother was, um, she had a career in radio and then on television in Canada, a much smaller country for those of you who are not keeping up with Canadian affairs. And her show in the 1980s, which was like the, 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 the double header, the equivalent of Nightline, um, was getting, got an audience well, approximately the same size as um, most of the shows in the you know, MSNBC, CNN evening lineup today, just because there's that, there's that much less on, on television. Um, and given that, there is, that the audiences are smaller, be experimental. So I, I blame the bookers a little bit for this. And I, I often think of a line uh, that David Cameron, the British Prime Minister, used in his 2010 um, speech to the Conservative Party conference, politics should not be so different from the rest of life where people with different views find ways reasonably to get along with one another for common ends. Or what Sean Gibbons pointed me to, a line from a Stokes song, what was it? Um, we're not enemies, we just don't agree. We just disagree from this is it. But it's not just the bookers. These are editorial, high-level editorial decision-making paradigms that, that we are, we may be locked in. It's, yeah. We're talking about an environment within which you communicate. Yeah. There's nothing moving that. Well, here's, here's the background to all of this, and I think this is why the past decade has made me felt different. Um, America's a country of strong partisanship, but weak parties. So we don't have really good mechanisms in this country for making tough choices. Um, uh, making rational decisions about how to allocate scarce resources. And in the past, the United States has not needed that, because this is such an astonishingly rich country that it could be quite wasteful. It didn't have to make rational decisions uh, about resources. You'd buy everything. You'd buy both the guns and the butter, both the defense buildup and the health care package. And if the numbers didn't quite add up, well, you'd put it on the deficit, borrow from the future, which will surely be richer than today. What happened in, the in 2008 was, I think, the choices became more extreme, the pressures became more intense, and we lost confidence in the future. And suddenly, America, the job of allocation became much more zero-sum, that everybody had a feeling, if you get something, it comes from me, if I get something, it comes from you, and we're going to have to settle this and settle it now. Um, now, pr more prosperity may m mollify some of this, but one of the things that we might take usefully from the experience of the past 10 years is to understand, look, we don't have to, it's not so zero-sum, but maybe we should imagine a world in which our resources are more constrained and we're not borrowing so much from the future. Because we're not just borrowing from the future economically, we're borrowing from the future ecologically, environmentally. That, you know, we are burning um, materials that were put in the ground over hundreds of millions of years, we're releasing them over the span of single years. Um, and they're, you know, that, that, that as part of our budgeting, we're gonna have to think also about how do you recapture stuff that was in the air that used to be in the ground and get it back down to the ground where it safely belongs, at least safely from the point of view if you're a human being and not a Tyrannosaurus because they liked it warmer. But the, those trade-offs require a productive debate. 
and I don't see that now. So we're in this era where we do have to defend the fourth estate from external attack, but I don't see yet a self-awareness from within our profession that will mature our decision-making and get us to that point of productive debate with a civic baseline we can actually build on. That's, that's my big fear for our profession. But there's yeah. so much to talk about it. You are a critic of the president. Your book is called Trumpocracy. What are the characteristics of Trumpocracy? That's such an important question because, um, look, I, I think we are, it's often tempting to reduce this to the personality of the president. I mean, every day, um, something happens that just would regard it as so unacceptable if any other human being over the age of three did it. Um, <laughs> and, and not great in a three-year-old, actually, not super charming. Um, I mean, I like three-year-olds, but, you know, they need some limits. Um, uh, but the, the question is, look, there, of course it, there are people like this. Of course there are people like this. The, the institutions of politics in a democratic country exist to keep people like this away from power. And those institutions have failed. So Trumpocracy is not a study of a person, it's a study of that person's power. How was it gained and how is it used? I mean, every day there are people who have choices, or people around the president have choices about how to deal with them. And they make choices that sometimes they think are somewhat public spirited, um, but usually are very self-interested. I, I think of that famous op-ed in the New York Times. I mean, of course, I don't know who wrote it, but what, what I was struck by was its tremendous vanity and its tremendous lack of wisdom. Um, that I understood there were some patriotic motives there for sure, but at, at some point you have to say, you know what, this, this is not working. You think you are preventing bad things from happening. But we're plunging into a planetary trade war. That's why the stock market was so upset today. Um, we are, it, it, we are we have, we're running a budget deficit right now relative to the American economy. So these, this, this, this is a time of relative prosperity and it's a time of relative peace. Um, that there are, I think, you know, we, we are not having many combat casualties. It's been rather grimly pointed out that actually you're more likely to be killed by gunfire in an American high school than you are on a battlefield anywhere in the world, which is good news for the soldiers, bad news for our high schoolers. Um, but in this time of prosperity and relative peace, we are running a budget deficit bigger than that which George H.W. Bush ran during the first Gulf War, and about the same as that which George W. Bush ran in the most violent moments of the second Iraq war. And, uh, and, it's, on its, and it's getting worse. And we are, going, we are on, if there's a recession, we are likely to find ourselves running a de deficit as big as that which Barack Obama encountered in the throes of the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. And all of that is borrowing from? From the future. Um, and all of that is, 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 and is to buy what? China. Predators. Well, well, it's to buy cr cr from creditors around, it's a, it's around a the, creditors around the planet. Ways. So, um, other than the president's colorful commentary, what is dragging down civility, and how do we restore it? Well, um, civil it, I think the most important cause is this um, zero, it, uh, the sense that politics there's less to go around, uh, that. Um, and that as, I think there's a particular problem that has to do with the aging of the baby boomers who are arriving at a period, this is the main audience for uh, serious journalism. Um, they're arriving at a, a time when they're on the verge of retirement or they've just retired. They are not as well off as they imagined they would have been at the peak of their earning uh, years 15, 20 years ago. Um, and this is not just an American problem. This is happening everywhere in the developed world. And there are contests between people who have well-established claims on the state and people who have new claims and both don't feel they have enough to go around. You know, if you think of the American system of government um, as a system of fiscal trades, who does well? The older, the rural, and the richer. And who does badly? Um, the younger, the urban, and the poorer. Uh, and those two, and when both groups feel there isn't enough to satisfy my basic requirements, um, the contest between them gets dark. In an age of inequality, deep inequality. Well, one, one of the things that has happened, one of the effects of deep inequality is um, America's very richest people are much richer than they were even 10 years ago, never mind 30 years ago. And with that huge increase in wealth goes also a haunting suspicion that somebody might try to take away from them. They well know, they feel insecure about it. Um, that may seem strange to others who say they seem so powerful, but the people inside that world do not feel powerful. They feel threatened, um, and they feel that, that um, 
even if they can't entirely justify what they have, they'd rather keep it than not have it. Um, and so you, you got this extraordinary stream of vitriol when President Obama was, was um, still leading the country, that you, it was quite a routine thing to hear, I mean, not Fox News blowhards, but leaders of major head funds complain, compare the president to Nazi Germany because he would make comments about the concentration of wealth. They felt under attack, they felt threatened, and they have the means to do something about it. We're in a room full of communicators, some of them with nonprofits, some with institutional philanthropies. In an era where there's so little trust in government, in media, in institutions, in many institutions, what role do you think foundations and nonprofits play in, in this sort of building of the future and, and a rebuilding of trust? Um, I, I'm, it, it would be presumptuous for me to tell professionals their, uh, their business. Um, but you know, one of the things at p previous periods of uncertainty about the country uh, that we have seen, um, you know, a, cent a century ago, when uh, in the progressive era, when um, the United States was coping with um, huge concentrations of wealth, uh, industrialization, urban pollution, industrial accidents on a scale that are just absolutely appalling by our modern standards, um, that at places like the University of Wisconsin, um, and then spreading out from there, the new Brookings Institution, uh, modern-minded people began thinking, can we just measure the situation of our country? Can we, can we, you know, we didn't used to know, there didn't used to be a thing called the unemployment rate. There didn't used to be a thing called the gross national product. Those things are creations. And um, we, we didn't used to know, um, you know, even finding out how long people lived, that, that took work that was done at the end of the 18th, uh, 19th century and beginning of the 20th century. Uh, so what these institutions can do is to begin to identify the answer to the question, if we, Lincoln's question, if we could know where we are, and they can begin to do to projections to answer his second question and whither we are tending, and then maybe leave it to the citizens to answer his latter two questions, we could better judge what to do and how to do it. Untainted self-awareness. Well, uh, in, um, information you can use, I mean, a, a pool of reliable facts. And one of the questions I get asked a lot when I talk about the media, um, I mean, we, you know, the, the Daniel Penn, Patrick Moynihan used to say, everyone is entitled to his or her own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. But we have pushed back the frontiers of human rights in the United States, and we now all feel we are entitled to our own facts. <laughs> and, and this is, if, if you think this is just affecting your aunt and uncle who watch Fox News, it's not true. You can see it on the left-hand side of the spectrum. Every day, there is some piece of, of false information that begins to circulate around the liberal Twitter sphere, and, and probably you've encountered that. Um, we're vulnerable to this, we're con confirmation bias and, and groupthink. Um, so there, it is a powerful thing if there are places in society where you could say, um, I, I need an answer to a specific factual question. Um, what is it? Is, uh, I mean, the, to the question it's often said, the American healthcare system is the greatest in the world. Well, that's a value judgment, and you can't answer that question. But you can ask, qu answer questions like, well, do, how long do Americans live compared to other people? Um, are they living more or less long? Um, how, are they having more or less active lives than they did. Um, and much of that, that information is collected by government, but the most valuable parts are collected by people like the, the Wood Johnson Foundation, um, the, uh, the Kaiser Family Foundation. They generate the information that people use to make responsible, well-informed decisions. And once they have it, how do they break through in such a noisy environment? What's your best advice for how they get heard? Well, uh, this comes to the limits of what you can do outside politics. Um, th there's a reason politics exists, and Americans tend not to like politics and not to trust politicians, but politicians and politics do indispensable work. What is a, what is a politician good at? What, what do they do? Um, and, okay, no jokes. Uh, <laughs> Silence. I, 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 I think of the, their core expertise is they are experts in the gaining of democratic consent. 330 million people, lots of opinions. Um, how do you assemble, reduce those opinions to a number small enough that coordinated action becomes possible? And we used to rely on the party system. Um, and the, and the party system would you know, reduce 
the infinite number of things that, the, that a federal or state government could do to a narrow range, build a coalition on behalf of a certain number of those policies, and then gain consent to implement that program while quietly and behind the scenes negotiating with the other party. There, we're going to set some limits to what we're, what we're going to try to do so that you're never pushed to the wall, um, and we're going to have one eye always on the fact that it's going to be your turn next time and that you'll also observe limits. And, and this practice is something that we, we depend on the parties to do. The parties are much weaker than they used to be. And we've taken away from them a lot of their um, instrumentalities. We took away a lot of them in the name of reform. I mean, um, many of you may know the, uh, the great story about Abner Mikva, who was a um, longtime Democratic career guy and then went on to a very distinguished career as a federal judge. And he opens his memoir with this story, that he's a young person, he's a teenager, very interested in politics. He lives in the city of Chicago, finds his way to the local Democratic clubhouse, knocks on the door, and uh, volunteers, I want to get involved in politics. And the guy inside the office is just what you expect, you know, open neck shirt, suspenders, bowler hat, cigar, says to him, says to Abner Mikva, who sent you? And Mikva replies, nobody sent me, I just walked in the door by myself. And the man behind the desk said, we don't want nobody, nobody sent. <laughs> uh, po politics used to be about an exchange of favors. Uh, it used to be about patronage and, and pork barrel. Um, and I think, our grandparents were, on the, for the most part, offended by that and set out to clean up the system, and they took away a lot of the tools with which politics worked, and, and probably for the better. But what it means now is that the people who are in politics are there for ideas, which can be both very noble but also very hard to, to deal with, because if, if what you want is a bridge in your town and if what I want is a road in my town, that is a very reconcilable difference. Maybe you get the bridge this year and I wait two years and I get the road. Maybe it's the other way around. Maybe, you know, we, we, work, we can work things out. Um, if what you want is gay marriage and what I want is no gay marriage, that's very hard to reconcile. And as politics has become more abstract and principled, it has also become less susceptible to compromise. So your advice is... <laughs> well, so, no, that was the very philosophical, so my, but my advice be is more we, channel we, the... We need to, we need to yeah. accept the fact that the... the um, the parties aren't going to do the work they used to do, and we need to find new mechanisms to build consent. Let me put this in a way that maybe is a, going to be a more difficult teaching for some of the people in this room. So one of the questions I get asked about a lot um, is about the influence of money in politics, um, and especially, uh, it's usually summed up under the heading of Citizens United, but people turn out usually have a much broader range of concerns than those dealt with narrowly just in that one case. And look, questions of money and class and power are obviously very important. Um, but here's the thing to think about. Before 1974, before Watergate, there were almost no rules on money in American politics. The only rule that really mattered before 74 was corporations could not give directly to a political campaign. Beyond that, do what you want. And there was no disclosure. You could, give money, you could make a political donation before 1974 in cash, in a paper bag. Uh, the, you know, so we, we know astonishingly little about how American campaigns were financed before 1974. And, so, and yet in this Wild West atmosphere where almost anything went, most people look back and say money mattered less before 1974 than has mattered since 1974 in a world in which it's harder to give money and money's more monitored. What happened? Why, was, why didn't, you know, uh, mil the millionaires and billionaires of 1947 uh, buy politicians the way it feels like they do today when they were in a less permissive world? And the answer was because the things you needed to get done in politics couldn't be done with money. If you needed to get voters to the polls, that was done on the Democratic side by the unions and on the Republican side by the mainstream pot Protestant churches in the North. Uh, if you uh, needed people to go knocking on doors. Uh, that was done by volunteers who believed in the party and were sort of hoping for a job after the election if their party won. Uh, so when you get rid of patronage hiring, those people stop door knocking. Now, I'm not saying we bring back patronage hiring, but we need to understand that the, that the world, and that the reason money has become so important is not just because there's more money, it's that because a lot of the institutions that used to do politics before the um, reforms are gone. The unions are gone, they're not coming back. Um, the, mainstream Protestant churches of the North are not coming back, and door knockers who are partly inspired by the party, but also with a view to a job after the election, they're not coming back. So systemic pathways for consensus and network building is what you're, what you're describing. No. To get super, super tactical, people in this room, just to, just to tweet, yeah. tweet a new direction, because really, I think it's really valuable guidance yeah. you'd have for folks here. 
either they're producing that knowledge, they're the pews and the folks, yeah. who are, or they're involved in nonprofits that are exposed to facts on the ground in America that we're not hearing about on MSNBC and CNN. And so where do you find the most productive place for those conversations? Is it Twitter? Is it Instagram? Is it somewhere else? Where do we go for a nationwide conversation that, that they can turn to and, and input into? I'm sorry, I'm sorry to have interrupted, but, no, but, sure. but I was reacting to something you said because I realized we may be on a path here where you may be right, but I'm not going to agree with it. Which is, I don't, I don't think, I, I don't think consensus is good. Um, I think what is good is meaningful, structured, responsible choice. That the, the job of democratic politics is not to bring everybody to one mind. If we, that, that would, that would be a bad thing to do, even if we could do it. Um, the job is to make sure that there is meaningful, effective, responsible political po competition within rules, where we understand what can be done and what can't be done. I mean, if, if, we heard, if you heard today that um, Facebook and Google um, and we're all going to work together for the common good, you get a little nervous. You think, I, I, I don't think they're going to be after the common good. We want those giant entities to be vigorously competing with the hope that that will make us feel more powerful. That's the same way I feel about politics. So the, the job, and maybe this is a place where this kind of work can be more meaningful, the job is not to get everybody to think the same way mm -hmm. about the issues of the day. Um, there, are, there are a lot of issues where you have to say, um, this is a contentious issue, there's, there's no clearly right answer. Uh, it's not obvious whether we should have more immigrants or fewer, whether we should have more of them being well, highly skilled, more of them being low skilled. It's not obvious. Um, uh, what we, um, whether we should have a bigger government that provides more services at higher cost. And uh, what you want is that, not a conversation, what you want is a competition, but where people agree, we don't tell lies, we don't threaten to put our opponents in prison, uh, we uh, don't use outright corruption, we don't prevent people with different views from participating in the political process, we don't purge the voter rolls uh, because to, to stop people who don't agree with us from voting. There are things we don't do. Now, having established that, tape up your fists, Go at them. Make it clear. Make the choice meaningful. And where do you see the productive conversation? Where, you're super active on social platforms. Yeah. Where do you see the meaningful, substantive conversation possible, if not already happening? Well, different people have different roles um, in the, the political system. And um, you, some, uh, you know, television remains by far the most important source of information uh, for most Americans, especially for the Americans who are most likely to vote. Uh, Facebook is creeping up as the next most important. Um, and everything else follows far after that. Um, you know, at The Atlantic, uh, our, our, we have a, this super well-informed audience. I mean, we are, we are giving, we are sort of helping them to enrich their worldview, but we're not providing them the worldview. And we're certainly not giving them advice on what to think about the issues of the day. They, you know, they, these are very sophisticated people, but different, different institutions have different roles. And the, the, uh, um, that one of the things that is really ominous about what is happening right now uh, is President Trump, well, let me give you a very classic example of this. Uh, I, this is just something I was working on today. I, to count. I, I, I was watching today an interview that Donald Trump gave to Dr. Oz um, in September of 2016. Hard hitting. Well, now this is- I wonder what they talked about biologically. Okay, they, talk, they talked about healthcare. And Donald Trump told Dr. Oz that uh, he was going to bring in a healthcare system that would have more choices, so many choices you couldn't believe it. Um, <laughs> it would be better care than anybody gets and way less expensive. Okay, so Dr. Oz is someone who tells audiences that you can cure cancer with raspberry juice. So, but here's the important, so why did Donald Trump, and these are, if you go through all the things that Donald Trump said about, the camp, about healthcare during the campaign, the most flagrant and outrageous lies were those he told Dr. Oz in that show in September 2016. So who watches Dr. Oz? Well, I, I, don't have, I couldn't find the demographics for the Oz show in particular, but I can tell you something about who watches daytime TV. 85% um, of them lack a college degree. Uh, the majority of them have family incomes under $30,000, and they're three quarters women. Uh, so Donald Trump, a real master of the TV medium, knew that. And he knew that this was a uh, poorly informed, probably much sicker than average, more in need of health services than any other group in the population. They're predominantly women, so health care is going to be, you know, for them and their families, they are going to be very concerned about it. And he went on, and he knew they wouldn't check, and they had no social capacity to check. And he went on and he promised them everything. And because, you know, 
they're used to, and maybe there's something kind of sad. I mean, on, on the one hand, you can see there's something kind of, you know, if you, you're going to believe that raspberry juice can cause cancer, that's bad. But, but maybe you have to believe that if you don't have access to the kind of medical technology that probably most of the people in this room have access to. Maybe you need to believe that, because otherwise, otherwise someone you love may be doomed. Before I keep going, how many burning questions for David are there already? OK, I'll come back, but I'll keep going meanwhile. So you've touched on part of what makes President Trump such an effective communicator to his target audience. What are the other things that really helps him break through and that made him so effective? Well, here's, here's one that I, I came across in researching the book, um, Trumpocracy. I, I, I'm, I now am going to forget who did this survey. I think it was Gallup. About three weeks out from the 2016 election, they asked this question, who is more honest, Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton? And by a considerable margin, Americans said Donald Trump. Now, now, this was not a good, it should be said, this was not a generally a good poll for Donald Trump. Just to, it was that if you ask the question, cares about people like you, informed about, the, Hillary Clinton clocked him in every vector except honesty. So you think, okay, um, that's odd because it's sort of a judgment call who cares more about people like you than Donald Trump, but it's pretty obvious that Donald Trump does lie more than Hillary Clinton does. So what were, they, what, what were they saying? I think one of the things that when you use polls a lot, and I use them a lot, you have to be really clear that the question you think you are hearing and the question that the pollster asked is not necessarily the question that the respondent heard. You know the phrase talking like a politician. What does that mean? Well, what that means is to equivocate. Politicians don't like to lie if they can avoid it. So they, they go through both doors at the same time. They leave both options open. You know, are, uh, Secretary Clinton, are you in favor of the Trans-Pacific Partnership or not? Yes or no? Well, I think, it ra you know, I think there are many important challenges here. It affects many different groups in the country. Um, we see, I see tremendous opportunities, but I want to make sure that it also takes care of our least vulnerable. And so that is why I have simultaneously voted for it, but also introduced, okay, um, Donald Trump, would take the temperature of the room, do they want yes or no? And then whether he said, and he would say yes or no according to whether he wanted it, and tomorrow he would say the opposite, and it wouldn't bother him at all. But whatever else he did, he did not equivocate. He did not talk like a politician. He might say something that is completely fantasy, he might contradict himself, he might say something that's outright untrue, but he said it decisively. He sounded authentic, he sounded truthful, and, and he sounded different from all other politicians who in order to avoid lying, equivocate. My personal curiosity, I'm indulge myself with one question. You're a lifelong journalist, but during your time in government, yeah. you were clearly part of a new conservative Republican wing that was considered yeah. far right for its time. Are you thinking you're, a, do you see yourself as a centrist now? And what is the center now? Well, Are you the center? Um, I yeah, like you to, personally, I, but I like you know, do you, yeah, is this? Here on the West Coast, I'd better be centered. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, uh, you raise many different questions there, and I, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to do justice to all of them. Um, I uh, am a very conservative person. Um, I am very. Con uh, you know, Ambrose Bierce, the great satirist, used to say, "A conservative is someone who prefers to adhere to present evils as opposed to a liberal who would like to try new ones." Um, <laughs> and, and so I, I see myself as um, as a conservative. But what, one of the things that Donald Trump has forced all of us to consider is, well, what, what are we conserving when we conserve? And that you're conserving you know, institutions that are a couple of hundred years old and ways of governing that are a century old and you know, social gains that are 50 years old that occurred in the context of you know, ideas that in Europe they would call liberal. That is the American, that's the American origin. Um, so, what I, so when I think about my own, I mean, it's not so interesting, my own political development, but I think that one of the things one, uh, here's one of the things I, I do strongly believe, is that politics is like an exam in which they are constantly changing the questions. And the answers of yesterday become obsolete very radically. Political truth is not like theological truth. You know, God is eternal, God loves us, God always loves us, um, but uh, the, what we should do now in today's economic conditions, that is not an, that's not something that is eternal, that is provisional. And, uh, as human life has gotten longer and longer, I mean, this is the anniversary of 1968. And President Trump, I think, was 21 years old in 1968, and he's still engaged in an argument about, about 1968. Now, try to imagine 
someone who was 21 during the Civil War, being president during the First World War, and, 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 it was, and finding the Civil War still more real, like not as a memory, not as something that happened to his parents or grandparents, but like something that he participated in half a century later. So we, carry around, we are at risk of carrying around obsolete, um, obsolete arguments and visions of the country. Uh, I, I think it's so, I think that the biggest challenge as we get older is to um, continue to learn from the, the, way, the way the world is now. And to my way of thinking, to be a patriot is to love your country as it is. And if what you love is some memory or fantasy of how your country used to be, and you condemn your country of today because it's not your country as it was, um, it, you're, you're a collector, you're not a patriot. You're, you're a fantasist, you're not a patriot. But we have to acknowledge that we're communicating in a climate where some of the quaint notions being conserved are judging people on the color of their skin and demonizing them for it, and I mean, anti-Semitism. Things that we thought were done, they're not done, apparently. Or there's, uh, anyway, that's yeah. just. No, but that, okay, this, uh, you raised there a very interesting, I mean, I'm, I'm Jewish and I'm, I try to be serious about it. One of, the, one, of, one, one of the things that is sort of, for those of you who are Jewish, one of the things that is, is sort of hard, uh, 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 Jews have always believed any kind of bigotry Jews have to prick up their ears because sooner or later they're coming for us. Um, and you know, we may not be first, we may not be second, but we're eventually on the list. What if it happened that you lived in a country in which anti-Semitism was so rare and you were dealing with people who authentically said, you know what, Jews, no, Jews are fine. Jews are fine, we have no quarrel with Jews at all. Other people we don't like, but you know that feeling that you have to feel, well, we have to be involved in this because sooner or later they're coming for us, we're not coming for you. Do you still say interested? Um, and it, um, I, I, I think there is, and Donald Trump, I'm sure, has many um, disobliging stereotypes about Jews, but I don't think anything he intends, I don't think there's any, the way that he has malice against other groups, he has malice against women, he has malice against many other groups. I don't, I don't think he's got a particular, you know, particular m malicious beyond a little bit of unfavorable unfavor stereotyping. And so the question is, can you still care about what he's doing to other people when you don't feel under the gun. That's a very novel experience. But what he's unleashing among others who aren't him. Yeah, that's a very novel experience. Do you feel unwelcome in the Republican Party? Uh, right, right now, yeah, but as I keep saying, I don't accept the jurisdiction of the membership committee. <laughs> and I, I remain a registered Republican, and I, I'm, I, I, a number of my friends have, have quit. Um, I understand why, um, but I, I take a long historical, I, I think you're, Institutions you've participated in, they, um, they go through bad chapters. I mean, you know, my friends who are Catholic are dealing right now with this tremendous sex scandal. They don't leave the Catholic Church. They fight for a better Catholic Church. Um, you know, um, uh, there have been a lot of periods in, in American history where the country was doing things. I mentioned the 50th anniversary of 1968. Um, you know, assassinations, riots. You don't stop being an American because your country is showing a dark face at that time. What, what you do is when something you care about is in trouble, that's when you're most needed. And uh, I don't think it does a country any good at all to have um, in a two-party system only one party committed to democratic ways of doing things you need to. So I, I'm staying and um, you know, I'm like the, bad, uh, like the bad house guest that I keep getting hints that uh, train's leaving um, and I just keep ignoring them and saying, uh, what's for breakfast? <laughs> <laughs> Burning questions for David? We've got one down here we can start with. The mic's coming down. And just introduce yourself before you. My name is Richard Latendresse. Uh, thank you, Mr. Fromm, uh, for being with us. Uh, still, uh, to continue on what you were just saying, uh, the polls tell us uh, that 40% of the Americans are still solidly with the president, whatever he has been doing, and 80 plus percent of the Republicans passionately lo love him. How do you communicate to these people yeah. who, whatever he seems to be doing and say, saying, still likes him. Well, I think um, many Republicans and the president himself are kidding themselves if they look at that numbers, because that's not the number I pay attention to. Yeah, Donald Trump has a 40% approval rating right now. The economy's super strong. But when you say, do you strongly support the president? Uh, that's about, 
that's under 20 percent and if you say do you strongly oppose the president uh, that's over 40 percent he's got a two to one ratio of people who strongly oppose him over people who strongly support him um, let me put it this way if uh for any other president if you had a year in which military casualties were as few as they were in 2018 and the job picture was as robust as it has been in 2018, that president would expect to be in the high 50s. Now maybe in, in a different era when we were less polarized, you might get into the 60s. Today, that's harder, but you know, you'd expect to be at 58% uh, with these facts. To be at 40, uh, that just tells you how mu much you've alienated the country. Um, and if the economy is softening, the president is rapidly going to discover that 40%, that's not a hard 40%. It's a hard 20%, but not a hard 40%. Um, and that number that Donald Trump keeps pointing out, uh, I'm, very, I'm more popular with Republicans than Ronald Reagan was, that's, that's true, except when Ronald Reagan was president, one third of this country was Republican, and today one quarter of this country is Republican. So Trump is getting more and more out of less and less. Um, but the last thing to say about that is no other president, literally none that I can remember, ever talked about how popular he was with his own party. My mother really likes me. Um, <laughs> take that. No, you, you, you wanted to extend the coalition, and, and both for reasons of public spirit, that you wanted to be president of all of America, and also for reasons of survival. Your own party can't elect you and reelect you, only your party plus, plus, plus. So what do you think happens in the midterms? How does this play out? Um, I, I think, uh, well, I think, I think this is one of those things where, after reading today's news, um, we need to all take a sort of little the pause. The Kanye thing? Which, which Not people? the Kanye thing. No, this, the, <laughs> the, 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 the second, there have been a series of really startling events in the stock market. Um, and interest rates are rising. And I think a lot of people are feeling an economic chill. Uh, we, this summer, we saw prices begin to rise at about 3%, consumer prices begin to rise at about 3%. Um, and, uh, for workers who are non-supervisory, which is the majority of American workers, after inflation, they're earning less than they were a year ago. Um, so I, I, when you say what happens, I think I, I am not sure that the economy that we have in our memory from the past six months is the economy a lot of people are experiencing and thinking about. Um, I think one other uh, thing to bear in mind is that I think many people took the lesson of 2016 to be that Republicans do better than the polls suggest they will. I think the lesson of 2016 is that when, you're, when the pollsters tell you, here's the most probable outcome, and then here are two or three other less probable outcomes, don't assume that the probable outcome is the certain outcome. When they, when they say there is a 60% chance that Hillary Clinton is going to win, you know, things that have 40% chances happen four times out of 10, <laughs> 40 times out of 100, <laughs> 400 times out of 1,000, we can do the math forever. So, uh, I, I, I think it's quite possible we see an outlier event. Um, and I think one of the, a lot of pundits in Washington have convinced themselves that the Kavanaugh nomination uh, was a huge boost to the Republicans. It's possible that it may make a difference in some Senate races. Uh, but if, if the challenge that Democrats always have, is the bigger but less intense and well-organized party, um, and the question is how do Democrats supply intensity to their voters, especially because their voters are so often concentrated in a few areas, the Kavanaugh nomination is going to be a powerful intensifier for Democrats. Um, and so even if the Republicans pick up the, this North Dakota Senate seat, um, that they have seats at risk in New Jersey and California, states hit hard by the Trump tax plan, and where Republicans in particular were, were hit hard by the Trump tax plan. Um, I would not be surprised if they lose all but one of their seats in New Jersey and if they lose um, the majority of their seats in Cal the seats they still have in California. For any questions? We'll go here and then this sort of crescent. And... Uh, hi, I'm Jeff Klein with the Hispanic Communications Network. Uh, how do we, mo when I was in 1968, we were all gonna go to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So we actually paid attention, you know, we brought the voting age down to 18. How do we motivate, to me, two big groups that aren't voting, one is or, or Latinos who actually don't vote at, at the rates they could. And the other is youth. How are we gonna motivate them, whatever your perspective, whether for, you know, to participate in, in, in the system, to, to vote? Well, you talk about those as if there are two categories and they're really only one. Um, and one of the things, we, we often talk about what millennials do 
as if millennials are the same ethnic balance as the rest of the population. Um, it, but a lot of the things that affect the way millennials behave are driven by the way Latinos behave. Uh, it's just that Latinos are much more numerous among the under 30s than they are among the over 40s, and so their, their behaviors matter more. And if Latinos don't vote, don't be surprised if young people who are so disproportionately Latino also don't, don't vote. Um, I, I, I think I found, and this may reflect all of our experiences in life, what, make, what are the things that make you vote? Um, having an address. You know, knowing that you're going to, like, to, to make the investment in learning the politics, the name of your member of Congress, you're less likely to do that if you're not planning on being in that congressional district three months from now. So as young people settle, they become more committed to the political system. And so when you think about how do you get them to vote, it's, it's not just, the answer is not from inside the political system, it's from outside. As young people, if young people were marrying earlier rather than later, if they were acquiring a permanent abode earlier rather than later, but we've got a population that, you know, um, if I remember these numbers right, that I'm now going to forget them. But the, uh, as of age 30, um, it was in the 1960s, the overwhelming majority, I think about 80%, were, were married or partnered by age 30. And today, about ha only about half. Uh, and certainly the proportion of, young, of people under 30 who are living without a romantic partner of any kind is at the highest since record keeping began. Um, and they're more likely to live with their parents than they were at any time since the end of the agricultural era. Uh, so when you think that the way you get young people to vote is to get them to do the things that produce voters. Have an address, settle down, be married. Uh, and, if we, and, and that then derives from econ both economic and cultural things. Um, that, that maybe marriage is driven by culture to some degree, but certainly settling down and having an address, that's driven by economic possibilities. And so you, that's not a super helpful answer because it isn't a magic formula. It tells you that you're sort of on a spiral where a lot of the problems in the society reinforce each other and getting back onto, but if you can get back onto a more virtuous cycle, those things will also reinforce each other as well. Hi, I'm Noelle, and I'm with um, Stand Together, and thank you so much for being here today. Thank I you. wanted to um, ask you about, um, to tell us a little bit more about how you would suggest talking about issues, because so many of us work on issues where a balanced opinion is necessary, um, the details are really nuanced, so it's very tough to communicate um, the nuances and complexities of these issues you know, in a short um, bite, and to your point earlier, you know, the, the political speak of, you know, kind of straddling the line is not as sexy as, you know, the more de um, decisive one sentence answer that right. Donald Trump um, speaks on. So I'd love to hear about how, um, how you would recommend we um, take on um, promoting that balanced, yeah. thoughtful opinion. Well, there are limits to what you can do because of the tax laws. You are 501c3s, three, or most of you, and so there, there are limits to things you can say or do. But let me, having set, made this point about Donald Trump and the equivocation, let me offer a counterbalance to that that may be hopeful, which is one of the amazing things about the human species, as magnified especially by the camera, is even when they don't understand what you're saying, they can see who you are. And I think one of the things that, I think this is one of the reasons that Donald Trump is caught in an undertow that is so much more damaging to him than, um, than the raw polls or than his supporters. I mean, it's, you know, it's very vexing to you that he will write an op-ed in USA Today and fill it full of things that are blaz uh, brazenly untrue. And it's probably true that very few voters could take up a red pen and go through that USA Today article and say this statement is, is false, this statement is false, even though so many of them are. But what they can do is they can see this is not a person of integrity. Um, and that knowledge has spread. And uh, he, it didn't hurt him as much in the election of 2016 because they had also made up their mind that Hillary Clinton was not a person of integrity and because they sort of hoped that he would be a person without integrity for them. Like the, <laughs> Right, like, uh, it's like better call Saul. I mean, if you've got a really good lawyer, you don't care if he's a good dad. Um, <laughs> and they, they figured out that he's not working for them. And that all the character flaws they saw that they thought would be at least, well, he'll do it for us. And I think he's caught in an undershot that people, um, this is the thing we need to know. I mean, we, you know, we've lived in 
this modern world with, of mass communication for what? Barely 100 years. And even um, the availability of texts to the literate, that's a pretty new phenomenon compared to human evolution. But we lived for thousands of years in small bands where it became very important to know whether the person beside you could be trusted not to run away when the mastodon charged. And, and that knowledge of who can be trusted, that's really a powerful um, force in us. It, it causes some of our bad qualities because you know, we, used, we did used to live in small bands, so we're very suspicious of people who are outsiders or different, xenophobia and racism, that's part of our, our character, that's wired into us too. Um, but Donald, uh, and Donald Trump exploits that, but I think people, I think lots of people ha have his measure. And so when you think, how do I talk? I think, well, I mean, depending on your audience, sometimes what you need to, to do is to communicate the nuances. But, but, but sometimes you just need, and I think that's right now the message that people need to hear most, you need to tell them just this. Kindness isn't weakness. Decency is real. Um, in the long run, people will do the right thing. You, um, and the, the, uh, the things that Lincoln kept saying, you can fool people some of the time, but you can't fool all of them all of the time. And, uh, and so when you're communicating with them, just, just to say, you know what, just, just try to be, if you can find some way to connect to that spirit of goodness that is dormant, but present, you ignite a lot of things. I had one more question over here. Do you want to read out? Hi, right, thanks for coming. I'm Blake. I'm here from DC with National Children's Alliance. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to go back to where you said that we need a political culture where some things are off limits. Presumably, if something's off limits, there has to be a consequence to breaking that. So how do we instill in voters an idea that when someone has lied, when someone has committed an act of voter suppression, that it's more important to punish that individual politician than it is yeah. to strive for that very desirable social program that they may want. Yeah. Um, I, when I was talking about um, putting the competition within limits, uh, this is a set of rules that are going to be enforced not by the voters, but by the players. Um, you know, in any, in any competition, like uh, the, the, you know, uh, in, any, any competition, hockey, the game I know best, um, that there's an idea of what you can do, you know, what's a, what's a clean check and what's a dirty blow. Um, and that's probably invisible to many of the people watching the game, but the players know, and they have mechanisms for enforcing it. The, the thing that I'm worried about is not that the voters don't enforce these rules, but the political professionals don't. Um, and that, you know, that, that what, what should happen is people say, well, you can, that's fine, you know, that you are behaving in this way while you're running for county commissioner. Uh, but now you're looking at higher office and we need to make sure that you, you're, you've tidied up your financial affairs, that you haven't abused your spouse. Um, and that is something that the parties are supposed to do. And right now the parties are in a state of very zero-sum competition. I think what will happen is, I, I think what is going to happen, if I venture prediction, is the near-term future for the Republican Party, which has been the main violator of the norms of American politics, uh, the near-term uh, is going to be um, pretty rough, and they're going to be in the minority. And one of the things that happens when you're in the minority is you suddenly discover why the rules are there. The rules are there always to protect the minority, and the experience of being in the minority rededicates you to the uh, importance of having rules of the game. When Mitch McConnell says, um, you know, what's the rule for conserving? It's whatever the Senate, the Senate majority leader feels like. That's a very attractive rule, so long as you're certain you're going to be Senate majority leader. Once you're Senate minority leader, that doesn't look like such a good way to do business. Are you more optimistic or more fearful for where we're going as a country? Um, I, it's not a way I think, and for this reason, that when you're asked those questions about the future, they treat the future as a thing that already exists. And they say, look at that thing that already exists and what do you see? And I, I, I am radically impressed by the unpredictability and contingency of the future, and especially the future from here. We're making the future. So I think it's, I, I prefer to think about, not about your, your vision, your assessment, but your actions. Um, maybe the advice would be, 
if, even if you want to think like a pessimist, act like, the, like an optimist. But, but retain the confidence that, that what happens next is up to us. It's in our hands. And so we don't need to have an opinion about the future. We need to have a project for the future. We need to have a commitment to the future. And it's been so much harder for so many others. You know, sometimes um, people will compliment people in po politics or public life and say that was a courageous thing to do. You know, compared to what other people have had to do, you know, compared to stepping out of a landing craft at D-Day, pretty no, uh, no. Um, we are asked so little compared to what our parents and grandparents were asked. It would be a scandal and a shame not to do it. I think we're out of time. Thank you so much for your whole body of work and for being with us here today. I One more round of applause thank for Thank you all. We never did get to sing memories. Next time. <laughs>